Think about how much you learn from only hearing one side of a phone call. It's actually pretty amazing how much you can get right if you only hear one side. You know if your wife is speaking to one of your kids and often which one? You know if your husband has a telemarketer on the line. You know your son is talking to his boss and then his weekend plans have probably changed. You know when the call is serious, sometimes deadly serious. You know when something wonderful has happened, even if it hasn't happened to you. We may think of the Psalms as being written from the human perspective and therefore not telling us much about God, but there are some elements which appear again and again. And those elements tell us a lot about how to envision and understand God. Now, last week, I described the Psalms as falling into three categories, Psalms of orientation, offered when the world was working as expected, Psalms of disorientation, offered when the world we thought we understood has been swept away, and Psalms of reorientation, offered to acknowledge that we've received an unexpected gift of something new being created in the world. All those types of psalms share common elements, and some of them are so common, we don't really even notice them. But they tell us a great deal about who is on the other side of the prayer. The psalms are almost all addressed to you, to a known, named, identifiable you. There are other places in the scripture where God is addressed with more titles, but titles remain when the person who they refer to changes. Mr. President meant a different person a couple years ago. In the Psalms, there is just you. There is no lack of focus, no guarded euphemisms, no neutrality, no uncertainty. No playing it safe, no new discovery or discernment of God. When we offer a prayer to some vague sense of the divine, we are trying to keep ultimate control for ourselves. By praying to the God we know, we... Oh, sorry, I've lost my place. By praying to the God we know, we are acknowledging both that we do not create the world and that we know who does. Sometimes the Psalms celebrate that God is the God we know. Sometimes the Psalms celebrate, remind God, that God needs to start acting like the you we know. But there is never any doubt in the Psalms who they are addressed to. The Psalms can speak to this known, identifiable you because the people who offer the prayers know the story of the you they are praying to. This you does two things. God creates something out of nothing, the world out of the void. God also reaches into history and creates the people of Israel out of a slave community. God's fidelity is the same, caring for the stars and the sky as faithfully as God cares for the widows and orphans and foreigners among us. God's fidelity is shocking in this world. God's fidelity also destabilizes the world as we know it, breaking up what we are used to. And God's fidelity makes new and leaves us with abiding astonishment, healed, forgiven, ransomed, restored, not believing it could happen, but knowing somehow it has. We speak to this you because we know what this you has done. And now in some of the Psalms we offer praise, we recognize that God has given us more than we could reasonably expect. Mixed into our praise is the realization that there is a congruity between who God is and who we are destined to be. Side by side with that extravagant praise, the Psalms offer extravagant complaint. You are not acting like you and you need to get on the job. The Psalms expect God to participate in this life, right here, right now. And if they feel God is missing, silent, not paying attention, 
The Psalms have a, the language to call God on it. We stay in conversation with God because we expect to have a stake in it. We know that prayer is the meeting ground where life occurs. And we will wait there with, for a response from God until hell freezes over. God has promised loving kindness and we will insist on it showing up. We insist on it because we have always insisted on it. And God's loving kindness has always shown up. We also lament because we can see the difference between the world as it is and the world as God intends it to be. We know that the real world is rife with injustice and driven by death. And we know that this is not God's intention. So we tell the story of how we know this and we offer prayers that God will intervene. We become more passionate, concerned and obedient to God's direction to love our neighbors. Because while God is absolutely needed to intervene, to get us back on the right track, to, we need God to reset the limits of what is possible. We have a role to play in the world between those limits. Our love of neighbor can bring a part of God's justice into this world. So we pray to God to include us in the work of justice. In the Psalms, we pray to our known named you, and we do it because we remember the stories of you. We offer prayers of exuberant praise and exuberant complaint because that allows us to name the reality of this world, its unexpected gifts and blessings and its only two expected injustices. But what a flimsy foundation to build a prayer, a life of prayer on. We build on memories, on words spoken thousands of years ago, and the experience of an often silent you. We walk away from the idea of a faith built on strength and authority and distance and precision. We choose instead to continue in our unshakable conviction that our prayers carry our meaning and are effective. We use our prayers based on the Psalms to speak about and summon genuine holy reality. We choose to live a life of weakness and vulnerability. And yet those prayers and the people who pray them subvert the status quo, dismantle injustice and liberate the marginalized. They tell us a great deal about the God to whom they are offered. Amen.